Hi, everybody, and welcome to episode 93 of the IROC Knits podcast. My name is Corey Eichelberger. Yes, it's a doozy, 12 letters long. It doesn't fit on all government forms. <laughs> and I go by IROC Knits everywhere on the internets. I design under the name IROC Knits Designs and Teach. Uh, I was just back from Madison the last time we spoke, and I had to explain that to each of my classes. And so if you are new here from meeting me at Madison or being in one of my classes, welcome. I'm glad you're all here. Pull up a chair and let's knit a little bit while I rattle and pramble on and on about all things knitting. A little bit of book talk, some recipes usually, and either a sweater or shawl. And today we have both, a sweater and a shawl. So I've got quite a bit here to talk about. Let's get going. What am I wearing today? This is my Toad Hollow tunic. It has a little detail feature right down the front and under the arms. I got a new shirt to go under with it. I was not wearing this one very much. It's a little long for me from here to here because I'm so short. And when I knit it as a sample, I knit it to size because it's a tunic and it, you want you know the proportions to be right. So I should rip this out and make it a little shorter for myself now that you know, pictures are taken and I could, you know, I just use it in trunk show situations. But I do like wearing these. They're long. I can wear my leggings with them. And uh, I didn't just have the perfect shirt. So. I brightened it up a bit. Imagine that. <laughs> And yeah, it is about as bright as it shows on the camera. It's kind of an orangey yellow, and that color is in um, in this tunic quite a bit. And so I thought, well, it was inexpensive, and uh, that's what I'm wearing today. It's bitterly cold out. It has been for the last three days. We had that huge wind. I don't know if you live in the Midwest, probably, or maybe just um, east of Minnesota, the wind was just howling Friday, Saturday. I actually had to cancel a photo shoot. Um, one of the items didn't arrive in the mail, but then we had some snow squalls, just little snow flurries, but the wind was so strong that it made it like a blizzard and we were doing an outdoor <laughs> photo shoot uh, for my new shawl and my cowl pattern. So I had to cancel and we had to re redo that. Um, I have several books to talk about today. Sometimes you guys ask me how I get so much reading done. If the book is really good, I get obsessive about listening and I just listen all day long. And I've been doing finishing up some projects and I'm gonna talk a little bit about the spring cleaning that's going on around here, but I've had the podcast or the audible books going nonstop. So I'm gonna to try to go through them quickly because I know this section get, can get long and some of you are not readers, but you could be audible listeners, so go for it. I'm listening to everything on Libby right now, but one of the books was from Audible. It was not available on Libby. So the first one was called Black Cake. It was by Charmaine Wilkerson and it was recommended on Instagram and it came up fairly shortly. I didn't know much about it. Here's the summary. In present day California, Eleanor Bennett's death leaves behind a puzzling inheritance for her two children, Byron and Benny. A traditional Caribbean black cake made from a family recipe with a long ago history and a voice recording. In her message, Eleanor shares a tumultuous story about a headstrong young swimmer who escapes her island home under suspicion of murder. It was very interesting. Um, a lot of um, black culture, uh, a lot of uh, stuff about this type of cake which I'm just dying to try I want to find the kind of a more original recipe and and kind of try it I, I kind of got the feeling it was like a, a molasses fruit cake kind of a thing where you're um, soaking fruits and things um, but I really would like to try it the book was was quite good I have reservations about this next book about even talking about it but I have told many people I loved this book. Romance novel, found it on Instagram. Someone asked, what are the best books you've read recently? And two people commented this book and kind of with the caveat that it was romance. And I don't, I used to always read romance. Back in the day, I read a lot of those, you know, bodice rippers. That was a long time ago. But this is called From Lukov with Love by Marion Zapata. I got it on Audible. It's a 
quite a long book. Um, so it was 15 hours of audible listening, which is long for most audible books. You know, I usually listen a lot in the 8, 10, 12 hour range. However, it is um, a romance novel. So you're going to get some such descriptive situations, right? Fully prepared for that. It's pretty explicit. It happens toward the end and there's not a lot of it. It's not the entire book, but it's quite explicit. And so I want to be careful for telling people to, to read it. The other caveat is the main character has a really foul mouth. That is not a problem for me because I taught at-risk students for 17 years. And so I have been around that kind of language where it's kind of in a familial, inborn, that's the way we speak at our house language. And um, I did feel like a, some of this was gratuitous. It fits the character, but not 100%. Like there's, there's quite a bit of vulgarity in her language. It didn't bother me but I just want to give those two caveats because other than that, this book was awesome. <laughs> I really liked it. I could not stop listening. Here's the summary. If someone were to ask Jasmine Santos to describe the last few years of her life with a single word, it would definitely be a four letter one. After 17 years and countless broken bones and broken promises, she knows her window to compete in figure skating is coming to a close. But when the offer of a lifetime comes in from an arrogant idiot, there you go, right? Ice skater, all about the ice skating world. Love that, fascinating, behind the scenes. And this was not um, a shallow characterization of any of the story. Some romance novels can be so light that you don't have a, a real strong storyline to follow. Not true here. Very strong storyline, very strong characters, their descriptions, their backgrounds, but also all the people around them are just meted out. So it is not what I would call a typical romance. You do know that that is coming from Lukov with love, right? Uh, but there, I was second guessing the entire time how things were gonna turn out, what, what was going to happen. And it was just the most enjoyable read that I've had in a long time. So if you're game for that kind of thing, um, the story will, and I also talked to a couple knitters on Thursday at my knitting group, and, and one of them said, I wonder if you were reading it, if you would have just skipped over that part if you thought it was going to be too offensive to your, you know. And I thought, yes, you probably would, right? In a book, if there were a foul language, you would kind of maybe skip that, and you might skip some of the highly descriptive paragraphs and not be nearly as bothered. When you're listening to those, they're, they're more um, impactful, right? You're, you're listening and you can get a little more uncomfortable with those um, descriptions. I found that same thing with that Fifty Shades of Grey series that I read and then I had to read all three of them because I wanted to know what happened. But so, excellent book. And to the two people on Instagram who both recommended it and I thought, how can you have just a few comments about books that people loved and two of them are the same book? I want to look that up. So I got it on Audible. It came back, came, you know, I purchased it right away with a credit and I listened to it. Then I read the essay by Robin Yoakum that is also only available on Audible. And you know what some of these um, books are doing is they're making them exclusive to Audible because so many people are listening on CDs checked out from the library, some of these other. So if you wanna get the book, you pretty much have to get it on Audible. You could probably also get it in hardcover. I'm not, I'm, I, I'm not sure. Jimmy Lee Hickam grew up along Red Dog Road, a dead end strip of gravel and mud buried deep in the bowels of Appalachian, Ohio. It is the poorest road in the poorest county in the poorest region of the state. To make things worse, the name Hickam is synonymous with trouble. Jimmy Lee hails from a heathen mix of thieves, moonshiners, drunkards, and general antisocials that for decades have clung to both the hard scrabble hills and the iron bars of every jail cell in the region. So it is the story, uh, it, you know, it's a similar story to, um, oh, what was the one about the guy who's the lawyer at Harvard and he grew up in the, as a hillbilly, you know which one I'm talking about. It'll come to me as soon as I take a moment, but it's, it's that kind of story. It's called The Essay. 
he does become this guy becomes a writer um it, it is a really good dramatic following of a family and what happens to a young boy as he's growing up so definitely recommend the essay by robin yokum then i read genuine fraud by e lockhart and i had read a previous book by e lockhart i'm gonna put a youtube trailer in the links in the show notes below it's one of the few times that i've seen a trailer after i started reading a book of course my phone was listening to me and knew that you know i needed to buy a yellow shirt and then also knew that i was listening to this book so it gave there a trailer popped up on my youtube i'm sure i googled these things and then that they find that things that you would need to to look up but whole nother thing uh, i really did enjoy it, it was uh fascinating This is the, the same author that wrote We Are We Were Liars, and that book had that strange twist um, to it, and you didn't really know what was happening. So Imogen lives at the Playa Grand Resort in Cabo San Lucas, Mexico. She spends her days working out in the hotel gym and telling other guests how she was forced out of Stanford. But Imogen isn't really Imogen, she's Jewel, and she's on the run from something or someone, which means where is the real Imogen? Rewind. This story is so fascinating because you start at the last chapter and it's told backwards. Had I known that before I started listening, the book would have been even better because I didn't realize it when they first start out. And it took me those first few chapters and listening to realize that they were going back in time. But the entire story is told backwards until I get to chapter one at the end really interesting premise. I would have liked to have read it rather than listened um, in some respects. I think I would have paid more cl closer attention to the way the story was being told, but you, you know where you're headed the entire time because you know how it ends. I have never read a book like this before where it was completely told backwards. Uh, it was really well done. This is on that whole um, premise of the, the um, vision show that I watched about the girl in New York City who you know was a swindler that's kind of what happens to this girl she becomes kind of a, a sociopath some things happen and then she takes over someone else's identity and you're, you don't really know why because you don't have the beginning part of the story see I've just had really interesting books one right after another right after another which makes me then always want to start another one immediately. Okay. And then the last one I read is Murder on the Red River by Marcy Rendon. That is a Minnesota-based book. Um, my friend at Knitting told me about it. I went over to Libby. It was available right away. There was no hold on it. And it is about um, a murder situation that happens on a reservation um, in northern Minnesota where we have quite a few reservations. And then this is gonna be a, a trilogy or more uh, following this same young Native American woman who is 19 in this book and has kind of been taken under the wing of the, the local town sheriff because there are some things that happened in her life and so he's just taken an interest in kind of helping her. She's a pool shark, she drinks a lot, um, but she also, um, also has, what would it be like visions or dreams or telepathy a little bit you guys ever watch that show on the reality show about the medium you know in new york new jersey lady where they they just kind of know things and and that's what it is it's not made off to be anything but what it is is that she really has some premonitions about things that happen and then they happen and so it it was really good not a long listen and i'm i've already put the second one on hold because i will want to read the other books in this series um, really meted out characters good storyline does revolve around a murder but i would not call it a murder mystery i would call it a story um about these people that has a murder in it if there's a difference for you i don't like to read murder mysteries all the time where it's just a murder and they solve it there's a murder and they solve it 
I, I like to have a little bit more meat. So one, two, three, four, five, six. Six books in the last two weeks. It's a, it's, I mean, you would think that my house would be a disaster and there would have been no food on the table. But my house is a disaster, but there still, still was food on the table. What's the recipe of the week this week? Speaking of food, good segue, Corey. Creamy sun-dried tomato chicken pasta by Half-Baked Harvest. I had a jar of sun-dried tomatoes in my pantry. I don't know what I was gonna use them for. I don't know why I bought them. And they'd been in there for a while. And so there are times when I just kind of look through and set out a bunch of stuff on the counter that's been in the pantry. And I think, How, what am I gonna make with it? So I looked up some recipes. This is by that Half-Baked Harvest gal. I love her stuff. If you don't follow her on and you're on Instagram, I would assume she's on Facebook too. She makes a recipe every day and there's a little video of her making it and then she posts the recipe and they all look phenomenal. Her desserts and cookies and bars and things often have coffee in them, like, you know, espresso, whatever, and I'm not a coffee fan. So that's the only caveat I would have for her, for me. But most people would love that stuff. But I go, oh, it's got coffee in it today. I wouldn't make that. <laughs> I just don't even like the smell of coffee because I've never tasted it. And so it's off-putting. Little things you didn't know about Corey. So I've never, I've never tasted coffee. Uh, Sun-dried tomatoes, chicken breasts, Italian seasoning, paprika, red pepper flakes, Parmesan cheese, uh, shallot, garlic, a shortcut pasta, heavy cream, Dijon mustard, baby spinach. It is delicious and we will have it again in a couple of weeks like I will make it again right away so good very easy um, cube up your chicken saute it and it really was a one pot thing you just kept adding stuff to this pot and then you get a bunch of liquid in there and you throw the pasta in Ross liked it I liked it he's not a fan of garlic so I always I always just use garlic salt instead of real garlic cloves I think that that would have given it more flavor but you know I haven't had been able to have peppers onions or garlic for 35 years and with until we go out to eat and we go out to eat Friday and Saturday night a lot <laughs> or bring food in so then I just order everything last night I had garlic hal halibut <laughs> so but that is the one thing um, that I think it has shallot and garlic and that would have even made it more fl flavorful and I just use dry spices because he doesn't mind that as much it was really good I'll put the recipe in the thread in Ravelry I also usually link it under here in the show notes for you to copy and paste and to your and you can print it out. But really good recipe. I had knitters over this week and I lay stuff on my dining room table and get everything ready. And a friend said last night, you've kind of given over your dining room to knitting. And I was like, yeah, poor Ross, right? Like I might move my project bag tree to right over here. I have shawls hanging on my um uh, little wine rack we don't drink much wine but we have a little wine rack here and I have shawls hanging on it I got I got yarn in the china cabinet like whatever but she saw this recipe on the table and she carried it out and she goes I just saw this and I said oh we made it it was really really good okay let's okay. do the sweater of the week this is the bay and gable sweater by Cecily Glowick McDonald um, that's kind of a, a designer name from my past. I haven't heard it as much in the last many years. And I was like, oh, I recognize her. This is a little bit older pattern. It came out in 2011. Um, but it is a very detailed with this really interesting little um, rolled seam down the front, you know, and then waistline here. But I don't ever do the waist shaping. Um, it's a little too fitted for me right now. Uh, I wish it were a little bigger. I, I might wet block it and, and stretch it out a little bit to see if I can't get it to fit a little better through the hips and rear end. Um, but my other option is to give it to my mom. She's a little more petite. You know, she's lost a little height. and But her problem is, is right now she wears her back brace a lot wrapped around her middle. So her center section, although trimmer, is bigger because of that back brace and she would love this color so i'm thinking that it may go to mom instead of staying here with me um, then i wouldn't have to fuss with it quite so much it fits 
it just pulls a little, which means that I would have to also seam the front band shut. The buttons are real small, the buttonholes are real small, they're gonna pop open really easily. I would probably do that anyway. And then it's got that really interesting, I'll try to put a, a picture of that neckline up close in this spot right here so that you can all see it. The sweater is knit in worsted weight yarn, 22 stitches to four inches in stockinette on a US six. Uh, it's a cardigan with lace details down the front and at the collar. It's worked from the top down in one piece and it was originally worked in Primo Worsted from Plucky Knitter. It takes anywhere from 990 to 1800 yards. It is sized for 31 to 59 and three quarters, so pretty good size range. It's like every three inch size range, which you don't often see, you usually see two or four, but it's every three inches. Um, I just thought it was really a pretty sweater and I don't knit a lot of pretty sweaters. I knit more practical, sporty, casual things and this one just seemed a little more dressed up to me. Um, so there you go. I think it's it's really pretty. I bought this yarn way back at a early ZK and it was out of Marigold Yarns Worsted Merino Superwash and I used five and a half skeins and it glows. If you are in good lighting or outside, it has just a lovely tonal glowing. I remember sitting in the marketplace and I must have been selling something with someone sitting in their booth and I looked across the booth all day at this yarn hanging on the thing and it just kept shining and you know, it was one of those things that I was like, I have to have that. It was called, the yarn was called Cancun. So. There is the sweater of the day. I have another 2011 pattern for you today. I don't know why they both kind of ended up um, being here together at the end, but this is the TGV, and that is uh, the high speed train in Europe. Um, that's the abbreviation, and it and she wrote it for high speed knitting, saying you'll just get it done so quickly. It's by Susan Ashcroft. It came out in 2011. The pattern is uh, European pricing for three euro. Um, it has stuck in it and then kind of a ribbed bottom. It's great for these to uh, yarns that change from one color to the next. I saw this back in the day um, in someone's projects and I wanted that same, that same color so. Um, the TGV, here it is, if I had just looked down further, stands for Train Grand Vitesse, Vitesse, High Speed Train, but also High Speed Knitting. Quick and easy, two section, sections, each worked with only one pattern row, which also makes it relaxing and meditative. No counting, no wrong side, right side, no stitch markers, no short rows, just quick and easy knitting with a satisfying, elegant result. Particularly good for showcasing or long uh, hand painted or long striping sock yarns. The pattern was originally designed for one skein of yarn, but can it easily be adapted to other weights? The pat this pattern relies on the qualities of garter stitch to re create the crescent crescent shape. So I do not recommend knitting the base with stockinette. You can read more about this in the Stitch Nerds group. If you don't like garter stitch, I would suggest use one of my patterns designed with a stockinette base. So there's just that caveat there. Um, I knit mine out of a Shoppelville Zauber ball, Zauber ball in the colorway Crazy. It took one skein of 459 yards. Uh, I teach in my shawl class how to wear your shawls. My shawl class is a lot about showing shawls and different kinds of shawls from through the years, different shapes and that kind of thing. But when I teach the class, I do a lot of closures, lots of ways to tie, pin, sew, button, embellish shawls so that it makes them easily wearable. And with this one, I just put it on the mannequin and sewed the buttons on there and sewed it shut. So in its effect, it you just put it on like a poncho. You throw it over your head, it's on for the day. It's hooked, it's permanent, there are no buttonholes. I just sewed the really bright colored buttons on that and I can just put it on. I can almost wrap it twice in that and have it be real tight, but not quite. So you can do that if you leave the ends a little bit further apart when you hook maybe one button, then you can put it around your neck and twist it and put it around again. 
if you know what I'm talking about, um, so that you have that big color swoop right here and then the other part up around your neck. Uh, it is just a lovely little shawl pattern, super easy. Maybe I'll hold it up a little closer here. Yeah, so see you have garter up there and then you just have this little bit of ribbing along the bottom. So if you have that single Zauber ball sitting in your stash, it's just so bright and cheerful. I, I couldn't resist knitting it like that. I don't make a lot of one skein shawls anymore, um, but this one works great, especially when you can just stitch it shut. I'm gonna leave that off as we, we move forward. Well, what did I finish this week? I finished a couple of things and one's this week I have a couple of finished objects. I had a couple of appointments. I had to go get the snow tires taken off my truck and it takes about an hour and I had to sit there and I thought, I have some bags that have car knitting in them. I'll grab a couple of those and see what I have to finish up. So this is one of the hats that was in a bag and this is Sun Valley Fibers. I made the plaid, lattice plaid hat out of it. It's in my project pages. Um, but I had leftovers, except they were leftovers in the opposite colorway. So I had used up most of the purple and used up quite a bit of the uh, white. So I had more black and more gold left. And th I thought, this is such lovely yarn. Someone in my family will love having a Vikings hat. So I just knit this up in their, in their worsted weight and I just striped it like four gold, two purple, two white, one black. And then I just made the super long cuff on this and I called it Vikings 2.0 because I already had one and then there's the the top of the hat and I think it turned out really fun that striping in there so it's a lot of gold but I think that's okay and it doesn't look quite so Viking but I just put stuff in my bin in the closet for Christmas and gifts and I'll give it away to someone at some point in the other bag was a pair of Churchill Avenue mittens. My mom, my, my parents were so both very um, thrilled that I wrote the Churchill Avenue pattern and named it after the street I grew up on. And mom said, well, I'll need a pair of those mittens. And why I cast them on and then didn't finish them for Christmas, I think maybe it's because they weren't done and we celebrated Christmas different with them this year. Anyway, so I opened the bag and they were like almost done. One hat was had the thumb, had waist yarn and the other didn't and one was knit up to like here. It was really a bummer, it was super sad. So I finished up both of the mittens here. I have not blocked them, I need to. They're, you know, they get a little wonky but they turned out super fun. I had leftovers that I was using the last little bits of yarn. This is all I had left of that rainbow colorway. And then I had to um, go into the second skein because I made two hats and two pairs of mittens already out of some of that yarn. I just hadn't finished this pair. And so I got those two things out of project bags, which is always awesome. I have some leftover rainbow yarn. When we decided to do that, collaboration with Mustache Yarn. She sent me several colorways to choose from and I so I had a one, a two, and a three to, to choose out of and I ended up um, choosing color two and so I have all of color one and color three left and I have my own in my rainbow bag. I have my own skeins of rainbow yarn already. And so I was like, gosh, now you've got all this rainbow yarn left. Maybe you should give it away. I wound it up because when I looked at it in the skein, you can't always pick yarn when it's in the skein, right? You need to wind it so that you see how the distribution happens. This one has a little bit more neon in the yellow. So I will put up a thread in the Ravelry group. Um, I do not have enough of the gray or the white left for either one of those skeins to finish a hat. I don't think I'll weigh these. Um, and if they are enough to finish either the mittens or the hat, I will put them in the, in the prize as well. If they're not, then I'll just put them in my, my bin. I, I'm not a good judge of whether, but I know how much each of those patterns I'm, I'm, I'm speaking to myself aloud here, even though you guys don't need to know this. So go to the Ravelry group and you are going to tell me 
um, what is your favorite season of the year because we're going into spring now and fall is my favorite season i love fall i love when we've had a warm hot summer and then it cool starts to cool down it's my favorite time i'm not a huge fan of the spring because we often have snow squalls in april <laughs> and it always looks dirty and muddy but just tell me your favorite season you can tell me why if you want but i will draw out of that prize drawing i'll make that a no chatter thread so then i can just do a random num number generator i'll give away the two skeins of rainbow because i still have two skeins two partials a tiny little ball and like another piece so i've got enough rainbow yarn to last me and worsted weight for a while so i may as well just gift these to people and they they were never colorways um, that she, I mean, she would have worked them up as colorways, but they're not available on her site any, anymore. So there you go. You can make either the Churchill Avenue hat or the mittens. Um, depending on if you have enough of the contrast color, you can make both because you do the cuffs, you do the cuff of the mittens and the bottom of the hat in the contrast color. So you don't need as much of the rainbow as you do of the contrast color. So you could pick and you could do it in black or navy, like any worsted weight yarn you might have. Um, but yeah. I will put that out in the Ravelry group and it should go up. I'll try to open that thread on Tuesday. When I'm editing tomorrow, Corey, remember. Two things I have been watching. I finished watching three seasons of The Marvelous Mrs. Maisel. It was excellent. I love following her story. Uh, it's a really unique, in-depth look at that era when women were not treated as independent, opinionated uh, women with any type of freedom and she decides to be a comedian and she tells naughty jokes and it's really offensive to her entire family um, she grew up on the upper east side in manhattan with money her parents lose their money and then you know she's and she gets divorced there's a whole that's all happens kind of in season one which is many were many seasons back so I watched season one and then I never watched the rest and so I was excited when I opened it the other day and I think I had two or three seasons left to watch a week or two ago and I was like oh I'll watch a couple of those every night I, so I watched that and I really liked it so comment below if you've watched it and you enjoyed it or want to talk about it and then the other one I just started watching so I finished season one and I started season two of A Place to Call Home it's an Australian television series. It takes place at the end of the 1940s, beginning of the 1950s. The main character is a Jewish woman who fought in the resistance. She moves to this town. She's a nurse. She gets hired. And then she meets the wealthy landowner. And it's the story of his family. Um, and the matriarch, the the mother is still living in the mansion. And... Um, and there's all kinds of stuff that happens. Uh, in season two, there's some really um, sad, icky <laughs> stuff. Um, the, el the oldest son of this family, a gay man, and he doesn't want to be gay. He, he wants to have treatment. He thinks they, you know, back then they thought they could fix it, fix him. And so he goes to a mental hospital and they do electric shock therapy and they inject him with... Um, drugs to make him vomit and then he watches videos of men it it is so disturbing that we did that to people or that people tried to do that to themselves um but I I do want to give like a little spoiler on that if that is something that you know would really bother you um season two in a couple in couple you know there's it's not all about that but in a couple of the scenes they show what he's going through and it it's horrific like I can't even he gets burns and they and they increase it and he doesn't know who he is he's out of himself it I just and then again I say these are things you need to know right you need to be aware of the way we handled things and the way things were happening and people were being treated and it's all done secretively you know and yeah the rest of the story is fascinating because the you know the landowner can't fall in love with the Jewish woman. His daughter can't fall in love with the Italian guy. And they do. And, you know, it's just all those societal norms that hopefully all of us are not living in anymore. But if you're watching that, comment, because I'm just on season two. And I think there are six or seven seasons of that. And, you know, I'm watching it on Amazon Prime, but I'm buying it. You can get it on Acorn. 
but I did a subscription on Acorn a while back and so I don't know if I can get another free subscription and I just decided whatever I'll just buy it you know it's twenty dollars I'll watch it for ten two weeks three weeks something like that it for me it was just worth it but you can get it if you do a free trial, seven day free trial in Acorn, you can watch it over there. And it may be other places as well. We just don't get all the all the fancy channels. We don't pay for all the fancy channels at my house. Special notes or things I have to tell you. I am teaching in Loveland, Colorado in April on a Wednesday, April 20th. And I am teaching when knitting goes wrong, fixer upper, and how to use Ravelry like a pro. Those are my two classes. I'm teaching on a Wednesday. The conference runs Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday. This is through Interweave. They are a publishing company, Mag's Interweave Magazine. Um, and they filed bankruptcy a couple years ago and got bought and they're rejuvenating and they run Yarn Fest every year. So if you are in the Colorado area, I suppose if you're in Western Nebraska or South Dakota or Northern, maybe Northern Arizona, I don't know. Um, you might be something that you've been to before, you've heard of, but if you haven't, I will be teaching. Um, my classes are not full, of course they're on Wednesday. I'm the new teacher on the block. I've applied for a couple of years and I finally got in. And so I'm not teaching at the peak times, Friday, Saturday, Sunday. So I have openings in my classes and they pay you, interestingly, by how many people sign up. The more people that sign up for classes, the more people who pay, so then they make more money, so then they pay you more. So, you know, zero to nine students, you get paid this amount, and then you get another, I don't know, let's say $100, I don't know if that's right, but for if you have 10 to 19 people, and you get another $100 if you have 19 to 29 people, or whatever, you get an increase in your rate. And so I've just been trying to advertise my classes. I think part of the reason they picked the classes that they wanted me to teach and so they're not my most popular classes that i've taught but they're things that other people aren't teaching and then i'm also on wednesday so i will be in the marketplace on thursday so if you are coming you don't want to take a class i'm going to lunch with shana um, on thursday i reached out and she's going to take me to a taco place how appropriate but then i'm in the market at 1 30 and i'm teaching corey's two color cast on as a demo and selling my books from 1 30 to 2 30. Um, on that day. So I'm arriving Tuesday night and I'm not staying through the weekend because I can't afford it. <laughs> well, I mean, <laughs> that sounded bad, but I'm only getting paid for the day that I teach and they get you a reduced room rate and I'm not covering my costs because I'm not getting paid enough, but I really want to get my foot in the door so that I can teach. So I am I'm not staying. I'm going to go home on Friday and so I won't be there through the weekend, which is a bummer, but I gotta pay for two more nights hotel and I'm not teaching. So if they would have had me teaching more days, then I would get a bigger stipend for my travel, but I only get $300 for travel because I only teach one day. Anyway, it's a whole contractual thing that's brand new to me. I've never done it this way before, but I also think part of it is to for them that they need to really cover their costs when you're running a convention, conference, during COVID, you don't know how many people are gonna show up, right? And we're just getting back into things and they can't afford to lose money. I mean, the, the company already had a problem financially, right? So I probably shouldn't have signed the contract and gone, but I was hoping that my classes would be more full. I didn't know that I'd only be teaching on one day. You guys don't need to all know all this, but it's. I think it's interesting. I didn't know that this is the way teachers did it. And so I think that that, you know, that's fascinating to kind of hear. Things I saw on the internet. Man, do I have a ton of stuff. I have been so busy looking at looking stuff up. I'm going to tell that a little bit in Corey's stories this week. But I ran across this hat pattern by Kristen Nicholas. Look at those colorful hats. Are they not fun or what? And I know Kristen Nicholas from back in the day. She has a farm out on the East Coast somewhere where she does knitting workshops and then you stay at the farm and they do, I think they do farm food and you get a farm experience. You can look her up. She does fabric, she does weaving and sewing. They teach um, weekends there, but her stuff is all bright and colorful and cheery. And so I was like, oh, I love her stuff. I went over and just looked at her page and just from glancing, you can just see all the color on her projects, right? Like you can look at these. Every single one 
is just color, 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 color. And so go look at Kristen Nicholas's. She's got great Christmas stockings and socks, sweaters, hats, you know, the whole, she's got something for everyone here. And they're all really bright and cheerful. And for me, that's what I need in the spring. I want to knit fun, bright stuff that is just, you know, lifts my spirits way up. So go look at Kristen Nicholas. Then I saw this bunny hat and you know, we're going into Easter here and some of you have children, little children and grandchildren. Look at that. Oh, I should just, I'll put it up on the screen. This is by Grump Arena. It came out in January of 2015 and it's like a little bonnet with two ears on it with a, like pretty ribbons tied at the ears. It is so cute. The pattern is $3. I, I, I want to knit it. I don't even have anybody to send it to, but if you have a new babe, it is really cute. Bunny hat with chin ties. Highly recommend that one. Then I was looking at YouTube tutorials. Oh, someone posted on Instagram. If you follow the Chili Dog, she does a ton of video tutorials on YouTube. A ton. Highly recommend. But I found this one um, for sweaters called a wrapped provisional cast on stitches for sleeve underarms. So good. You know how you cast on stitches at the underarm and then you come back around and pick them up later? She puts them on a, a thread so you don't have to pick them up. Perfect, so great. Sorry, I got interrupted there by the husband and the dog, but <clears throat> this is one of those things that I watched on YouTube and I was like, why did I never think of this, right? Running a thread along with your cast on stitches. It was really good, so I just wanted to share that. Then I found a knitting song, and I am going to share a little bit of that. It's by Billy Odie, and I have a note here that says, 1964, Parlophone Records, I do not own the copyright in this recorder, recording. Prior to forming the com comedy trio, The Goodies, in the 70s, Billy, Bill Odie recorded several singles as a solo artist in the 1960s on Parlophone, Polydor, Epic, and Dandelion, all of which did not make the charts. Well, it kind of makes sense to me that a knitting song didn't make the, the charts, but. Some guys like to die if a gal does them wrong. And others lie awake and cry the whole night long. Some people lose a baby, they just throw a fit. But me, I just sit down and knit. I'm gonna knit. Knit, knit all day, I'm gonna knit my blues away. Well, if I'm feeling low, I knit a row. Cause a fella needs his knitting just to ease his soul. Well, hello, King Cole, I was married. You have to go over and listen. He does a whole pattern that, that you're going to knit to on this row. And I haven't tried knitting what he says, um, but it is so, it's an entire song. It lasts three minutes and 14 seconds. I will link it below and I'll link it in the show notes. It just made me smile. I had never heard it before. And it's kind of a little hillbilly rock and roll like that through the whole thing. And it's all about, it's got all the knitting terms. I, I had, yeah, it just made my day to find it. So I really wanted to share it with everyone. Okay, we're gonna have a little talk time here and then a couple of Corey stories. I have been spring cleaning. Uh, ever since I got the shawl design done and the test knitting started um, for my last two patterns kind of of the year here, I have been cleaning out. And I wanted to do this for a couple of years, go through all my yarn, all my bags, I didn't put it all out on the floor, but I opened things up and looked at what I had and I just started making piles. And one of the things that I have overbought is books. I have knitting books from 35 years of knitting and they didn't fit in my shelves anymore. And so I had stuck them in this cabinet under the TV and they were not accessible. And I would never look at them and I just decided, you know what, if, even if you knew you had it, you don't know where it is. So I sat on the floor for four hours one day and just looked at each one and decided would I reference it or not and would it be better in the textile knitters library here in town or should I donate them, give them to some other people? You know, they all have patterns in them, some outdated, some not, but I just really wanted to 
do the books. So I started doing the books and then I kind of went to yarn. And I knew I had four bins of yarn in the basement where I have just been keeping leftovers. So scraps, pieces of um, yarn, but then also quite large quantities of leftovers from knitting things. And I always put them in a Ziploc baggie and sometimes I'd add two or three projects and then I'd put it in these bins in the basement. And I finally decided if you had to find an old yarn, it's not organized, you don't know where it is, you'd have to go through every bag and every bin to find it. So I sat downstairs one night, my husband went to bed early, I'm in the basement and I have my uh, scale and a marker and Ziploc bags and anything that seemed to be smaller than like a 40 gram ball, I threw away. I put it in, I put it in a, I mean, I had, you know, bits and pieces. I have hundreds of mini skeins and I have jars of yarn everywhere of leftovers. So this is, these were just non-categorized, didn't always know what they were. I fit it, filled two tall kitchen garbage cans with little balls. That's how many were in there. Then anything that was more than that, I put in a baggie and I weighed it and I had tons of baggies in there that I was getting rid of. So I just kept, and I weighed it and I put the grams on the outside. And I ended up with two heaping bins full of yarn to give away. And then I called the library knitters who I knit with and I said, I have, a friend had painted the inside of her house and they had taken everything out of closets and painted and so she had sorted her stuff and she brought it to knitting group and then everything that was left over from nobody taking stuff, because a lot of us at knitting group have our own stuff, we, she gave to me. She said, take it to the library knitters and see if they want it. So that got me motivated. I did all of the books, then I did the yarn and I had magazines, old knitting magazines, which I had categorized on Ravelry and I might be sad sometime when I can't find a pattern that I knew I owned, but it felt so great. And they came over on Tuesday and they went through yarn, they went through patterns, they went through books. And it's, now I have one bin and two boxes of books to, give, to still donate. Um, but that night, my friend Mary Brevig called, texted, emailed me, not that it matters, and said, Corey, there's a post in the on the next door app that the local Presbyterian church between the town her town and mine was gathering curtains, sewing machines, yarn, fabric, knitting needles, and crochet hooks for 50 Afghanistan refugee families because all the women teach the girls to sew and knit or crochet. And I did not know that. And I it was such perfect timing because they were looking for all this stuff. And we have an extra sewing machine in the basement and I have fabric in the basement and I have leftover curtain bolt. And so I started following this thread and I gathering my stuff and then I thought, I've got, I've got a little box of acrylic yarn in the basement and I've been keeping it for years, like I'm gonna teach knitting someday and we're not gonna have enough and I'm gonna need it. And I just said, it's perfect for that, right? And so I, I got in touch. I. I posted that I had knitting books and magazines and would they use that or not because I'm thinking I don't know if they're English speaking so I don't know if they will you know if they even want that and she said the response to doing these crafting programs and giveaways has been so great from this community they've wanted all of it and so she said yes bring it otherwise we'll find somewhere to go the woman who's in charge is a is a um, Salvation Army volunteer and then the church is is collecting the stuff and then they're getting it to these 50 families that they have newly I think housed or brought to the to Minnesota and so now I was just so motivated right like I can just give stuff I will feel good about where it's going I don't have to contact someone at the textile center and see whether or not they have the books I have or even want them. I just know that they'll go to a good place. So I have been scourging my stuff. I have a needle holder behind the door in the closet that I rarely go and take a needle out of. I have favorites now, you guys know. I love my square wooden needles. That's what I prefer to knit with. And if I don't have those, I probably have metal. And if I don't have those, I probably have bamboo. And then lastly, I have these ones behind that are hanging on this hanger 
And I thought, you know what? If you have to buy a new size 19, 24 inch because you you gave it away, fine. But hanging on to all your extra straight needles, all your extra circular needles. So I went through all my straights and I kept two pairs of each and I still have a huge bag of straight needles. And then I went through and I thought, okay, I'm gonna keep two of the red lace, uh, red cabled needles that I had in there and the rest of them, I'm just gonna donate the whole hanging thing, right? Cause they're all labeled and it's just been such a great feeling. I'm just in the mood to throw. I, I just feel like there's too much stuff in my house. I want some of it to go. There are There's yarn everywhere. Like every room has yarn. You know, it just, you get to a point where, and so I had six bins in the front hall closet. And the office closet is the only place I want to keep yarn. And I've overflowed into the hall closet. And I started putting sweater quantities in big two gallon bags because they didn't fit. And then it, and then I had some, I had a tote full of project bags. So I went through project bags and I thought, I love them all, but I can only use a few at a time, right? And so the library knitters, most, some of them don't have any. And I don't know that these women will have any. So why wouldn't I gift some of those? So I went through that and I washed a couple and there's a stack of project bags. It's just been, <laughs> yesterday I did patterns in my basement. I had a bin with five three inch three ring binders full of knitting patterns because back in the day we printed everything out and if I printed a pattern then I kept it in a plastic sleeve with the labels in the sleeve of the yarn I used so I had a, a whole bin called things I knit for Kylie well I haven't knit something for Kylie that she has worn a lot except for socks in the last 10 years like at some point they become too cool for mom right to knit sweaters and stuff I mean eventually I would but this was all like baby stuff two, one, two, three, four year old stuff I don't have a lot of babies in my family right now and a lot of the patterns that once I got going were, were on Ravelry from 2008 on so I sat with these books yesterday from 10 a.m. till 5 30 and I went and opened each book and if I thought I wanted the pattern, I logged, I had it on Ravelry, I looked for the pattern, and then otherwise I took it out of the sleeve and recycled the paper and put the sleeves in the bin. I have hundreds of plastic sleeves. Just, just that alone, throwing them, they kept sliding off the desk, you know what a plastic sleeve does? So I finally went and got a bin, and the bin is this full. And you know, they're, they're thin. It is just so, oh, it's just so nice. I wouldn't have found one of those patterns if I needed it. Now, I kept a few. I set aside a few things that I've never knit. I had a couple of little pamphlet books that I would want to keep, and then the rest went in the bed, another paper sack to go to these women and their daughters who are learning how to knit. And so, and it's going to just be great. It my, But right here, there are one, two, three, four, five, six, seven things sitting right here two bags on the table. The mudroom is full of boxes because my husband brought up boxes so I can make them in smaller because I can't lift some of these book box. The two tubs are too heavy. It's in my, and he was like, is it, what, what's going on? <laughs> and I'm like, the dining room and the mudroom are gonna be well, a little congested for the next two days while I get this all organized. So tomorrow I'm hoping to drive. Not that I couldn't take it again, but they just posted last Tuesday. So you really wanna get the stuff there, right? And not delay it, because they're trying to get stuff out. And I know they've had a really good response to sewing machines. There were a lot of comments from people saying, I have a sewing machine in my basement, but I'm not sure it works. And they were like, no problem. We can't take them if they're in a table or chest or something. But if they're a standalone sewing machine, we have a man that will fix them. He is volunteering. And we also will take parts from yours to fix other ones. And then a lady said, I have an industrial sewing machine. If you can get out of my basement, you can have it. And she's like, I will send two men to come and heft it out of your basement. We will see whether or not we can have someone that can use it because if they need curtains and they're getting fabric, they could sew if they had industrial machines. I don't even know if they're setting up actually crafting days where the people can come in and just use the stuff and then take it with them. I don't know enough about that, 
but boy has it felt good. It has been a literal week of purging just everything I can find everywhere. And I found yarns that I will never knit with. I found two sweater quantity bags of gray yarn. Why, why, why would I? I'm never gonna knit gray yarn. Maybe I bought them thinking I would knit something for Ross or my mom, but gray is not Ross's favorite color. And, and it's a sweater's quantity, so I sent it to my text group and I have three gray, three or four gray lovers in that group. And I said, is, they were already wound up. I don't know why, don't know when I did that. One whole bag was Madeline Tosh, one whole bag was Malbrigo. I said, anybody want these bags? half price and they're gone right I already shipped one out like <laughs> and now I found this kind of brown and black brown and dark brown and black twisted yarn it's a dream in color they're like five skeins in the bag it would be the last thing I would ever pick to knit with it's beautiful yes but I, like I just couldn't so now I'm down to three bins in this closet and I really want to work that down so that I only have the stuff that's in the office closet, which is very narrow and goes all the way up. So I'm taking stuff out and saying, I would knit this up quickly, this up quickly. And so the bigger, thicker yarns and things that I still wanna make, the Aran weights, the chunky, the bulky, right? You can get those out of there. Oh, it's feeling so awesome. I'm just so glad. But during this process, I was looking at some paperwork I had for listing like all my patterns. I have felted knitting patterns on Ravelry from back in the day when I taught felting classes. And I probably have, oh gosh, 30 felting patterns that are free on Ravelry. And I did a whole felting episode. So if you're new, you can go back and look at all the bags and animals and slippers and hats and all the things I felted. But I wasn't very organized with I've been keeping handwritten notes of like what I wore on the podcast, what sweater I talked about, what shawl I talked about. Like I had these sheets of paper, but they weren't updated. So I went through and like copied and pasted stuff from into databases so that I could make a list. So I have like all of season one, what I wore, all of season one, all the shawls I talked about, all of season one, all the sweaters I talked about. So that, and they were all in like, different files but I conglomerated it all so I could be like okay you've never talked about these 10 shawls you've never talked about these 12 sweaters I and then I printed out what those were and put them in the podcast folder so that I could eat more easily set up for the podcast because sometimes I'm like I don't know if I talked about this sweater or not oh I wore it on the podcast but did I actually talk about it like did I tell people like I might have just said, this is what I'm wearing, but I might not have actually. So super organized. Now I have three, <laughs> three big lists so that that can be organized and done. Um, it, it has just been so good to purge. The next step we're going to is the basement. Um, Kylie's coming over one day this week because I'm going to go through her upstairs closet. She's lived away from home. This is her seventh year now. And, you know, she has a, a, a couple things in the basement. Um, she's got some clothes in her closet upstairs. She's got some sweatshirts and stuff. And I said, can I just donate them all? Or do you want to come and look? And she said, I kind of want to look. But she said, I'll know like right away. Like if I've got horse jeans from seventh grade in my closet, I don't need to keep those anymore. And so I said, I'll, I think it would take us less than an hour for you to go. Yep, mom. There's not that much left up there, but there's some stuff. And if we're going to do a donation run, then I would just as soon, you know, do it all at the same time. And if she comes and does her closets, it'll give me motivation to do mine. I just have too many shirts. Just way too many. I wear a lot of them, but I have too many. And I turn my hangers around backwards. I've shared that before where I turn all my hangers around when I switch my closets out. And then I get rid of stuff where the hangers aren't turned around. But I haven't, I haven't done that the last two years because we've been at home right and so I wear the same three fleeces the same one favorite sweatshirt every day <laughs> like I just leggings I, I'm just not haven't been out as much so if you're doing spring cleaning good for you if you I think it just if you get in the mood and you're just motivated to just do it it can be a huge job the office everything has been in upheaval but really nice to be getting that that kind of done so anyway that's 
story number one, getting that all done and getting it gift to, gifted tomorrow. I was talking to a friend or saw on a podcast somewhere the other day, you know, I sit in a rocker recliner and, um, and I don't recline very often, but I often have the foot rest up, right? And I've recovered in, in those recliners. I've had several over the years. Um, and someone said, I, what was I, I might've been the, um, oh, you guys will know because you saw it too. It's the two gals, the two sisters, anyway. I think they said that there are two two different things. Their father or their uncle or something said two different things for sitting in a recliner. It just made me laugh and I wrote it down. It's sleep and eat. <laughs> and I was like, that is so true, right? You go back in the recliner, sleep, and you go forward in the recliner to eat. It made me laugh. So if any of you are sitting in a recliner right now, give you a little laugh of the day. And then I have a little Corey story about Kylie. Um, I don't know if she'll appreciate me sharing, but I, I mean, I don't think she'll care, but it is her story to tell. Anyway, on Thursday, Kylie took uh, the first uh, section of the bar exam for law school. And you can take this section early. It's the kind of code of conduct or ethics uh, part that they've added. Lawyers in the past didn't take it. And now it's a new section and you have to take a class in it and then um, to have to take a test. And so if you want to take it early, most kids take it in the spring of their senior year, then you don't have to prep for that part for the bar. And so she, a lot of her friends were doing that and she's like, that's what I'm gonna do. So it was her spring break, so she scheduled it for Thursday. And Tuesday night I got the panicked you know, call, oh mom, man, I'm so nervous, this is so hard. It's gonna be so hard. So it was a 100 question multiple choice test, three and a half hours, I think, something like that to take it. And like every answer can be right, you know? I think a lot of times it's like situational and then you can you have to apply kind of the rule of conduct or something. I don't know enough but about it. <clears throat> but she had done a practice test and she'd been studying and studying and um, and she said, I just can't look at it anymore. Like I, my, I'm cross-eyed, I've looked them over, I, I've studied and studied for weeks. And, and then she said, Stevie helped me last night, that's her sweetheart. And, and he would say, he would read a practice question and then she would answer and he, he'd go, good answer, Kylie. It's wrong, but that's a really good answer. And so she, he was making her laugh and, and telling her, you know, just trying to keep her spirits up and, and they were going through questions. And so I, you know, I told her, I will pray for you and, you know, that you're calm, confident and clear of mind and you're the smartest person I know and you've studied so hard in seven years. And, you know, she knows her stuff. She, she you know, she's, she has always worked really hard. And so I gave her the mom pep talk, right? And her dad called her the next day and, and she went to take it. <laughs> so I saw her on Friday after, she, and she called after she took the test and she's like, it's done, you know, went okay. But then she had a story. We went to lunch on Friday and she had the story to tell. And she's a lot like me. It's probably a little embellished, a little dramatic, but I have to tell you. She went to this testing center south of St. Paul and it was at like a publishing company, book publishing or something. It was kind of, she said, kind of like an industrial business park, but like a strip mall. And you and you went in and it was in the basement. You went down to the basement and they test all kinds of people. So they test EMTs, they give, you know, she said she thought there was maybe like English profici proficiency testing, some stuff going on. And so, you know, you have to check in and she went like an hour early to make sure she knew where she was going, but that she was in the parking lot because it's, you have a assigned time and she went in and she was not prepared like she had to have three forms of id and she knew that and she knew she could take nothing into the test with her except those three forms of id and um and she got there and they like scanned her hands <laughs> and then the lady made her lift up her hair and they looked behind her ears and they looked at the bottom of her feet and you know they're checking for cheating and they had to go through a, a scanner, I think. But then they give you a locker because you can't take anything in. So they, she was checking in with this other guy, and he was doing the EMT test. And I, they had, a, they had said something to one another, and they were both going through. And this guy was doing this, and she said the guy wasn't very happy, and he was kind of, you know, crabby. And she said, I can't imagine him doing that all day in this basement. And she said, it, there's no windows. They're down, and she said it's where happiness goes to die, mom. <laughs> So she made me laugh about just the background of the place, but they went to their lockers and the guy next to her goes, hey, this key doesn't work in locker 12. And the man was right there and the guy goes, 
you don't have locker 12, you have locker 12B. And so Kylie and this guy both turn and they look and that they go 9, 10, 11, 12, 12B, 14, 15, 16. And the guy goes, we can't have a locker 13 because people were freaking out because it was bad luck. And Kylie looks at the guy and he didn't really say anything. He didn't seem to care. He moved over one locker. But literally that is locker 13, right? <laughs> and so she was like, like you could name it 12B, but now the, the guy totally knows he has locker 13. He didn't seem to mind. But Kylie said she was kind of chuckling to herself like mind games, right? Like anyway, so she goes into the room and there's a woman in the room and she's up high, I think, and there's she's surrounded by plexiglass and she just watches the whole room. She just turns and watches the whole room and I don't know, like 15 cubicles. It's not a huge room. And there's a computer in each and you have to pay um, if you want to bring your own computer in, but if you use theirs, then if something happens, you're covered. So she was using their computer and the lady said, you have to watch this tutorial on how to take the test and then once you open the test and start, your time will start. And she said people were coming and going the whole time, like every half hour because their tests were shorter and she was like, I want your life. Like you're gone and I'm still sitting here. But she watched the tutorial and then her computer went black. So she was like, oh my God, what did I do? Did I do something? Like I haven't opened the test so my timing hasn't started. So she raised her hand and the lady comes over and she goes, oh wow, okay, um, I'll just move you to a different cube. So they move over to a different cube and the lady opens it up and then it says, you have already started on a different computer in the room and the lady's like and the lady should know that by now right like so they go back and the lady has to power down and reboot this laptop which is fine because Kylie's time hasn't started but then she said she's sitting there and she's just thinking I don't want to use this computer like if it goes black I know I'm covered because I'm using their computer but like I have I'm stressed and I don't I don't want to do it but she's like I'm just gonna not touch anything I'm just gonna very carefully read and do my thing and she said I don't know three hours later she'd you know done or two hours I she'd done all her answers and she was reviewing her answers and she thought she had you know enough time to kind of go over a few things and she said for sure there were some she knew and then there were some that she had remembered but forgot you know like what the rule was and um so she was reviewing and she hears this commotion in the lobby and there's a woman out there who does not, seems to not speak English well and she's really loud and she's kind of yelling and talking and doesn't know, you know, and, and people in the room are kind of looking around like, what's going on out there? And so this woman comes in, so the lady comes over and takes her to a computer and the lady's like, this is where I take my test. And, and the lady's like, shh this is a testing center, you know, we have to whisper, you have to be very quiet. She's like, I don't know what this is. And she's looking at the computer and Kylie was like, and, and she was kind of close to Kylie, I think, but she didn't know how to use the mouse. She's like, what is this? And the lady's like, you have to keep your, you know, and Kylie said she felt bad for like the people who were like just starting their tests because it was so distracting. And she's trying to tell this woman. So Kylie was like, you know what, I'm pretty close to, to want to walk out of here anyway and the woman was like trying to teach this lady who was having trouble understanding and was just so loud um she said I, you know she didn't know she was hard of hearing or if she really didn't know how to use a computer or and she said if, if it was like english proficiency or something i mean it wasn't going to go well this lady did not know what the mouse was she said what is this and, and kali was just she said i just had to get out of there she said they, you know the whole thing had just been kind of a the test went fine she won't find out for month two months or something how she did um apparently they changed the questions on the test over you know and so it's kind of graded on a uh scale of you know how people do and then it's kind of sw swung uh, and i said is the bar that way and she said yeah it's really like on a curve and so they don't find out right away because if they they switch out questions so that people can't cheat and they you know they can't get a hold of the test or i i don't like I said, I'm not privy to all the information. She usually does most of her stuff on her own, but I went to lunch with her and I was, I was just like, no wonder you were exhausted when you walk out of there. You know, I mean, all this stuff is happening and you're, you're you know, the people are, you're in this dark, she said, dungeon where happiness goes to die. And anyway, 
she has to have a good sense of humor because the whole thing is super stressful and you know you got to get through it all and you pay i don't know i think it cost her like 250 300 to pay to take the bar and you have to have you know you have to have your social security card and your driver's license all checked and you have to go before the board right to say that you've never had a violation that you haven't already announced to the it's all that stressful t stuff that you have to remember so just going through this process has been really fascinating okay one more short story here i was talking to my mom on the phone and because i'm going to denver in april i was telling her how i was going to teach and that it's right over my birthday and that I wasn't gonna get to Sioux Falls um, probably for Easter because I was leaving that next day. And now Ross has decided to use some miles and go with me um, just because he's nice. And I have to rent a car and go, I don't know, an hour up to Loveland and stay. And, and he was like, you know, you're gonna have some uh, quite a bit of downtime between stuff and whatever. And we like to travel together anyway. So he's going to go. And so I was trying to tell my mom that we'll both be gone. And then we were trying to figure out what to do with Cody. And I know some of you will ask. I hope you can't hear him howling. He's in the garage and he wants to come in. So he's singing. He's been singing a lot more. It is not. It's not pleasant. We call it singing. You know, I've talked about that. But um, he seems to be fine. He seems to still not know that he has cancer. Um, he's running with my husband in the morning or walking. And... You know, I took him for a walk on really nice days last week and he's eating and going to the bathroom fine and doesn't seem to be having any side effects. It's just that he's getting, he's old enough now that he has trouble laying down and getting back up. So when I go to the office to work for a while, if he's in the family room, instead of just getting up and coming in and being by me, he knows I'll pet him and then he can lay on the floor by me, he'll howl. He'll just howl and howl and he just cranks it up. It gets so loud. And then I'll go out and my husband's like, he's howling more because you give him a treat. And I said, I don't give him a treat every time he's howling, but you can't, you know, Ross is working upstairs and sometimes he's on calls. You can't just let him howl and it gets so loud. I do sometimes give him a treat, but <laughs> anyway, he doesn't seem to know. So he seems to be, you know, doing fine. But I was talking to my mom and I said, you know, now I think Ross is going to go to Denver with me. We've got some miles and you know, we, I told him I'd kind of like to go on a trip this spring. This is not what I had in mind. We were going to stay through the weekend. We had originally talked about, you know, him coming because it's my birthday and we were going to kind of make a trip out of it. But now with Cody, we really need to get back. Like we really need to not stay and we don't really know how he'll be doing then. And so we have him set up to go to the local kennel um, to stay. But if things go down, then Kylie can come out. And I, we talked to her about coming out and staying at the house. Um, if he's not doing well or whatever he loves daycare he loves the people there he's he's been going for his whole life 12 years um and some of those women and men have been there forever and they love him and he loves them so that wouldn't be an issue just be if he started having trouble so then kylie said nope i'd be okay with that and i could come out to the house so telling mom about this whole thing and i'm telling her that i'm going to go to denver but i'm actually going to be in loveland and and she goes, well, I, I would like to, I would go along. I would go along. And I said, mom, you want, you want to go to Denver? And she's like, Denmark, I want to go to Denmark. <laughs> and I said, mom, I'm not going to Denmark to teach. I'm going to Denver to teach. And, and she said, well, if you ever go to Denmark, I want, I want to go with. And I said, I would love to have you come with me to Denver. But honestly, it's going to turned out to be a quick trip out one day and back two days you know a couple days later and uh you don't want to go to Denver and, she, and so I was just laughing because she thought I was going to Denmark I've never traveled abroad to teach so I thought that was kind of kind of cute on her part that she has a a desire to go to anyway I think that's about all I have for today I'm going to kind of wrap it up here there's a lot of stuff on the table and I hope I talked about it all I almost always have to come back and add something in that I forgot so whatever I will start editing it is Sunday afternoon here the sun is shining but it's bitterly cold um it's supposed to be kind of cold this all week and then warm up later hopefully I can get that photo shoot in uh, thanks for all your comments last time. I really appreciate it. Some of you comment on books. Some of you comment on recipes. Some of you tell me what's going on in your life. Um, I'm sending some warm regards out to a couple of um, listeners who are fighting a cancer journey. Um, 
uh, a friend in Tessnitter whose husband passed away. I'm thinking of you often. Um, you know, there's a lot of sadness in the world right now. And um, I send my, look at this, I've got the Ukraine colors. Oh, that's kind of interesting, isn't it, that I chose to wear this with the blue sweater today? You know, the world is just a really scary, um, upsetting, frustrating place. Uh, and so come in for your hug and give you all a big hug and just say, you know, I, I feel like I know you. Um, I feel like some of you have shared enough with me over the years that we are friends. And I, you know, I hope you're doing well. I hope you're hanging in there. It's hard to watch the news. Um, this weekend we watched that team from New Jersey win <laughs> in the basketball. We don't watch a lot of basketball here, but you know, they're the underdogs and they started out way back and they keep winning. And, you know, so it is, um, we're gonna watch them here uh, in a little bit see how they do so those uplifting stories that kind of make you feel a little better about how things are going because you can't watch the news and man just lots of stuff so until next time keep your fork keep a colorful waddle on buy the gravy you'll never regret ripping back don't complain with your mouth full i love you all keep it colorful see you next time couple weeks and hopefully it will be spring and sunny and warm and we'll be going into kind of a better season. Uh, talk to you soon.